Please join me in the call to worship. If it had not been God who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been God who was on our side, when I can peace. Then when they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger toward us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. What must be the sovereign, our God? God has not given us over to be to betray their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name, in the name of, God, of God, the maker, maker of heaven, heaven and earth. Please join us in hymn number 307, Glorious Things of You Are Spoken.
Brookfield United Church of Christ in our Sunday morning worship service. This weekend, many of you know that uh, we celebrated in Washington, D.C. the 60th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, 60th anniversary. So, so many things have changed, so many things still need to be changed in racial equality, social justice, bringing more peace in our midst. So think about those issues, particularly today, as we think about peace and need for peace in our midst. As I pray, may the peace of Christ be with you all. So, let us greet one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, just as there are thorns on every rose, there is sin in every one of us. Knowing this, we feel vulnerable and ashamed for who we are and what we do. We lose sight of what is important, and that we may come to you for the comfort, but instead we fear you for punishment. We do not consider the commitment of faith and the beauty of your gospel. Forgive us our trespasses and be with us in comfort. Forgive us for not being like family to all people who are the earth. We quickly lean on our assumptions and rely on our initial instincts to distrust and to keep away from people who do not know them. Or who are different from us. Help us learn that they are just as human as we are. Help us to grow to be more like Jesus. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. The mercy of God is everlasting. Your sins are not held against you. And by the work of God in Christ, you are forgiven. God, God, God has, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Alleluia. Amen. Please join us in hymn number 574, in Egypt under Pharaoh. The truth we will be singing is true is on the opposite page, which is Bank Chuck, number 573.
You may be seated. Lou is going to come and read from the book of Exodus. Exodus 1, starting in verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, and, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they sent taskmasters over them who oppressed them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of skilled labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed upon them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside her. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child to mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. God bless the reading of God's word.
Notice how many men of Moses' generation departed in the Exodus. And the footnote that the two midwives quit to raise their own families, code for Pharaoh forced early retirement. <laughs> So I want to share with you this morning a reflection that I published in the Christian Century magazine three years ago, the last time that this selection from Exodus appeared in the lectionary. And when I wrote this piece back in 2000, I was thinking, or er, 2000, wow, well, 2020, you know, three years ago in 2020. We're old friends. Okay. Um, when I wrote this piece in 2020, I was thinking, about stories of asylum seekers at our southern border. Uh, I was thinking of how oppressive regimes always seek to control women's bodies. Uh, I was thinking of incidents like the one that I mentioned from this pulpit in my Pentecost sermon, that time that a white woman called the cops on a black bird watcher in Central Park for no real reason. Um, I was thinking of older stories, like the tragedy of Emmett Till and the culpability of Carolyn Bryant, who accused him of flirting with her. And as I return to these words that I wrote inspired by those stories three years ago, um, I think all of those stories continue to be worth our consideration. Um, and I think the message stands, but yet as I return to it to bring it to you this morning, I think it takes some new shape in this congregation right now as we decide how to interact with our nearest neighbors, uh, with the people who were displaced by the closure of the shelter in our building. So this morning, as we consider baby Moses floating at the water's edge, can we see in his face, the face of the baby who was born at the Mellon Square parking garage last month, to a mother who would otherwise have been in our shelter with better access to care? And as we consider the threats of Pharaoh and his thugs, can we recall the video that was taken Friday night, less than 48 hours ago, of officers punching a man on the ground in front of our church, an incident now being investigated as an inappropriate use of force. And as we consider today the risky allyship of the midwives, Shifra and Pua, and of Pharaoh's daughter, Bithia, can we ask ourselves truly, what kind of allies are we? And what kind of allies might God be calling us to be? At first, Yogabed hit him. As a Hebrew mother near the Nile, in this era when her people lived under slavery and oppression, Yogabed knew perfectly well what happened to baby boys. So when Shifra and Pua, the canny midwives, put this infant child into her weary arms, what other choice did she have? His very strength was a liability. His very existence was a reason for fear. And so his mama held him close and sheltered him. She whispered his name into his ear, his hidden first Hebrew name that no one else would ever know. She repeated to him over and over again, you are strong, you are loved, your life matters. But in the end, Yochabed had no choice but to send him out. All mamas have to give their boys to the wider world someday. They can't hold on to them forever. They offer whatever they can to protect them. For Yochabed, it was a basket of papyrus with the cracks sealed tight, and the watchful eye of an older sister thrust into a role of responsibility when she should have still been at home playing with dolls. For other mamas, it's a long talk about what to do when stopped by police, or it's an address of the uncle on the other side of the border. Mamas try to love, wrap their love around their sons like a bulletproof vest. And yet the world comes anyway, like a river current, carrying them off into danger. As the fragile little boat bobbed among the reeds, the Egyptian princess Bithia 
daughter of Pharaoh, took notice. She was a person whose existence had never been hidden, whose voice had never been silenced. She had always had everything that she needed. She carried her power as easily as her servants carried her towels and her soap. Yochebed's baby boy was at the mercy of a person of privilege. And worse, a woman of privilege. It's a hard truth to recognize sometimes, but history bears this out. Privileged women are dangerous. Our tears stop dialogue and draw attention back to our hurt feelings, distracting from the matter at hand. Our good intentions stymie meaningful action. Our toxic charity keeps poor people poor. Our emergency calls summon agents of disaster. Our accusations lead to lynching. Our privilege kills. As a woman of privilege, Bithia had a choice when she heard the baby's cries. She could easily have responded out of loyalty to the system that had given her every advantage. She could have called Egyptian 911 to come eliminate this infant threat. And that would have been fair. She would have just been following the law. Alternatively, Bithia could have responded with a kind of paternalistic benevolence. She could have sent this boy off to an Egyptian nursery where he would never know his own people. And she could have patted herself on the back for being so enlightened and progressive. But she did neither of those things. Instead, something pushed Bithia beyond her privilege. The Bible calls it pity, but it seems deeper than a surface sympathy. We have heard of this kind of pity before in our scriptures. In the first chapter of Mark, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we read, A leper came to Jesus begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. The word that Mark uses in his gospel in Greek is uh, for pity is the word shlegnitsomai. And it means kind of just what it sounds like. It means that Jesus felt pity in his guts. His whole body felt it. And that's the kind of pity that Bithia felt too. A gut-wrenching reorientation toward the other. It felt like the relentless call of justice, the sense that something about what was happening was just not right, and the certainty that she was equipped to change it. Bithia could have wielded her privilege like a weapon, as so many women have done before and after. But instead, Bithia harnessed her privilege as a tool that enabled her to serve. With the help of her maids, she lifted the boy out of the water, giving him a new life and a new name, Moses. Then she re-enmeshed him in his own culture and reconnected him with his own family. Miriam became his companion. Yochebed became his nurse. Even more radically, Bithia found a way to compensate Yochebed for the usually unpaid work of mothering, offering her wages for her labor. No one other than a princess could have flouted Pharaoh's murderous, murderous laws so completely. The Bible offers only the faintest hint of what happens to Bithia next. Our scriptures are understandably unconcerned with the stories of powerful people. They prefer the scrappy kinds of underdogs whom God favors. So we don't find Bithia again in the book of Exodus. We don't know how she reacted when the baby she saved grew up to be an exiled murderer or a stammering prophet. 
We have no idea if she ever spoke to her father in the midst of the plagues, leveraging her power on behalf of her adopted son and his family. And we don't know how she reacted that night when Moses led the people far away across from the river, across the Red Sea. And yet, many pages beyond the book of Exodus, deep in the dusty parts of the book of First Chronicles, where they list the long genealogies of the people of Israel, we find this note under the descendants of Judah. One of Merib's wives gave birth to Miriam, Shammai, and Ishba, the father of Eshtemol. These were the children of Pharaoh's daughter, Bithia, whom Merib had married. In the end, it seems that the princess became part of the family, linked not only by adoption, but also by marriage. The noble woman attended by servants became a wilderness refugee, wandering with her new clan 40 years in the shadow of Sinai. She gave birth to her own vulnerable children. She named her daughter for that brave girl at the riverside. Bithia became Jesus' great-great-auntie, an unlikely ancestor winking from the family tree. Today, Yochebed's children still make their perilous journeys, armed with little but their mama's fierce love. Some of them stop to rest on the steps outside our door. And Bithia's a plenty, sunbathe at the riverside, capable of casual cruelty, but also, at our best, able to subvert the very systems that sustain us. God calls us into holy conspiracy and invites us into one tangled family for the sake of the most vulnerable, for God's own sake.
and how we often fail. Let's recognize the prayers that are rising from within our hearts. A prize as we see injustice in the world. A prize as we see hunger in the world. A prize as we see homeless people right in front of our church doors. Now let us turn to prayer of intercession. Gracious God, who loves all and who gets them, we bring to you our prayers for all your children, for all whom we love, watch over and care for. Your For all prisoners and captives, and all who suffer from oppression, that you will manifest your mercy toward them and make all hearts as merciful as your own. We are For all who bear the cross of suffering, the sick in body or mind. We are For all who are troubled by the sin or suffering of those they love. We are For all who are absorbed in their own grief, that they may be raised to share the sorrow of others and know the saving grace of the cross. For all perplexed by the deeper questions of life and overshadowed with doubt, that your light may guide them. For all who are tried by temptations or weakness, that your mercy may be their strength. For all who are lonely and sad in the midst of others' joy, that they may know you as their friend and comforter. For the infirm and aged, and for all who are dying, that they may find their strength in you and light at evening time. For all forgotten by us, but dear to you. O compassionate God, hear our prayers, answer them according to your will, and make us channels of your infinite grace. Through Jesus Christ we pray. At this time, let us join together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. At this time, let us continue in our worship by the receiving of our tithes and our offerings.
explaining the prayer of meditation as we would before. O gracious and generous God, we give you thanks for the blessings you bestow upon humanity, though we know we must do our part in making earth more like heaven. We pray that you may help us be more like family. Please accept these gifts and use them according to your will to do good for your holy church, your people, and for the whole world. We pray this all in the living name of Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 552, in the crush of wealth and power. And so can we. May we go forth today compelled by that gut-wrenching sense of God's justice and mercy at work in the world. And may we join in that spirit wherever we find it. May the blessing of God, who is Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, fall upon us this day, on all those for whom we are called to serve, which is everybody. Oh. Mm -hmm.